Osborne Ruddock, better known as King Tubby, was born in Kingston, Jamaica, 1941. Tubby was an electronic genius, and his deep knowledge let him convert his small mixing studio into a, a powerful music making tool. That studio changed the face of music. The echo rings out to this day, and he did all this as the head of a business empire. This business repaired home electronics, sold wire components, fixed up sound systems and pressed acetates. And for all of his work he had a team of assistants and protégés. As much as he helped found genres of music, he also gave young men a way out of the ghetto by learning a trade. His makeshift studio left hundreds of dubs but there's very little else. There are photographs but there's no moving images of Tubby himself. Uh, just one taped interview. So what was King Tubby like? Tubby was no Lee Perry for a start, reckless and high. Mikey Dredd, the Jamaican broadcaster and, uh, and, and singer, remembers him as generous and having a good sense of humour. Uh, but he, he was very different from the wild men, Rastafarians and rude boys of Jamaican recording legend. You'd never guess from his engineering work, but he never touched the herb in his life. He didn't even like the dread smoking in his yard. He was teetotal too. Dub producer Scientist describes meeting him like this. After I met, met Tubbies, it was you know it wasn't the guy that we was imagining, you know, smoking weed, rush the one love. This was more like a corporate guy, businessman, uh, very strict, um, neat and tidy, very serious. Everything about him had to be in order, says Mikey Dread. Uh, his workshop, his studio, and his shoes. It's difficult to keep his shoes clean in Jamaica, but if he saw something on his shoes, he'd, he'd pull out a handkerchief and wipe it off. It's attention to detail like that that made Tubby's engineering work, his sound system and the dub plates stand out. He started out fixing radios in the neighborhood. In 1961 or two, he built up his own radio transmitter and briefly ran a pirate radio station playing ska, rhythm and blues, which he shut down when he heard the police were looking for him. Uh, it was a logical move to set up his own system. The police didn't like sound systems. They were rowdy, but they were legal. It, and he set up his, uh, as a family business. His brother made the speaker boxes for a start. Oh yeah, that is in the 60s, up to 76. And it was own town in the 60s. King Tubby is in the 70s. That is from 1972 up to 76. The name Tubby comes from his uh, mother's maiden name, Tubman. And also it suited the sound he got, especially the bass. The King Honorific was gifted to him early in his career for his mastery of matters pertaining to sound. And as well as running his own sound system, he did contract work for others. If you wanted your system to stand out, from and to the crowd, uh, Tubby and his team were the ones to call. And at the centre of it all were Tubby's investigations into the science of sound. He read extensively and frequently uh, gave books to those he saw as being clever enough to understand. And he was constantly applying that knowledge to his amps, speakers and assorted devices. Bunny Lee, who's uh, listed as producer on a big chunk of recordings that were mixed at Tubby's, puts it like this. He was an electronic master. You know, and a self-taught engineer, he always practice and the building up something, you know. One kid who got to hanging around the workshop was Lloyd Woodrow James, who watched Osborne Ruddock repair radios, build amplifiers. He used to wind fence farmer for amplifiers. He, he was the one who taught me to build amplifiers and, you know, I just stick to that and that was my future. Lloyd James became Prince and later King Jammy and would joined Tubby as a, as in the studio as an adult. And he was just one of the apprentices that Tubby took on all sides of his business. Mikey Dredd remembers that he was very critical of his apprentices, damning their efforts with faint praise. The boys looked up to and respected Tubby. Uh, the system wasn't the biggest on the island, but for connoisseurs, it was by general agreement the best sounding. And it was innovative. For a start, it was at Tubby's sound that his DJ, Uri, uh, was the first to chat over an instrumental version. It seems that Tubby's sound was the first to showcase reverb and echo effects as part of the sound system. These were all devices that he soldered together himself. They were devices and ideas that he took into the studio and refined. Uh, now, it's here that the line between producer and engineer gets murky. 
Tubby was technically a mixing engineer, however, the ways he ended up shaping the music he was involved in putting somewhere different. Today he'd be credited as a producer and paid, but that's not how it went then. Uh, his nephew Keith Ruddock says this. You never did a, you never did a contract with nobody, you know, I would say it would be 88% of the work that he did for a lot of people, we never got paid for. The producer, songwriter and record vendor got the money, not the mixing engineer. And very often the producer was Bunny Lee. Uh, like Lee Perry with his upsetters, he had his own house band, the Aggravators. Uh, like the upsetters, they also they were a rotating cast of players. Among them were the likes of Tommy McCook, uh, Sly and Robbie, Augustus Pablo, many, many more. Uh, all great players, but and each combination was essentially a reggae supergroup. The house bands, uh, the upsetters, the aggravators made the, made the raw material, the rhythms. Tubby was freelance from 1968 onwards, applying his electrical knowledge. And he, he started to strip down tapes, particularly from Studio One, and, and drop these mixes as, uh, as, special, as special weapons of the dance. Uh, his knowledge of effects and principles was the best on the island. And, but no matter how generous he was with books, he wasn't so much with anybody knowing his secrets. He kept a competitive edge. Well, he was surely a technical person. And his techniques, you know, he alone had that techniques. You know what I mean? That even me, who was so close to him, couldn't get his techniques. He did it secretly. Like Lee Perry, he set up his own studio as a base. In fact, it was Tubby that wired up Scratch's Black Ark Studios and mix engineered a heap of his classic albums at his own place. Uh, Tubby set up his studio at his mother's old house at 18 Drummondley Avenue in the rough and tough area of Waterston, Kingston. Or rather, he set up a one-stop electrical shop. One part of the building was just studio. The next part of the shop was just electronics. King Tubby's studio was, wasn't really a big proper studio. He had his, his dwelling house and he just converted the bathroom into the voicing room. And he had a bedroom next to the bathroom and that was the, the, the room that he, he, he had his equipment in, you know, like a master room. If Lee Scratch Perry was a shaman, Tubby was a scientist and not even the mad so. It was an organized business. Optimising the equipment was just part of making the business run better. Uh, the famous MCI mixing board is an example. For a start, the desk was custom made. It's one of a kind piece. It was also broken and Tubby and his brother set about upgrading it. The quick response on the channel was probably like about 150 to probably like about 6k to be honest with you. They, they brought it up to about 12k, dropped the bass down to about 20 yards for real. So they, they replaced all the circuitry inside. In fact, all of the equipment in the studio was customised like this. The reverb was a Fisher, but I mean, that's not a Fisher reverb, that's what it is said. That's a key trouble reverb, you know. The Fisher Space Expander, apparently, if, uh, if legend is correct, was designed to be a real spring reverb for your car radio. How that sounds on a, on a pothole road, I, I'll let you guess. Um, but this wasn't the best equipment, but it was all customised. It was adapted for the job. He was like the king of that. Building effects units and, you know, and, and reverb units, building preamps, custom preamps, the sound system and building sound system. That's where 99% of the money came. So Tubby had a kind of cottage industry going on. He was engineering records, he was doing versions around the clock, he was running a sound system, building amps and speakers, soldering on through the darkness. His business was churning out acetates as well. I was cutting like two, three hundred dub plates a week, man. When it comes to acetate dub plate, my father and my uncle have the best of that era. But it's what was going on inside the studio that still resonates today, that echo comes from uh, feeding back one of those old tape, four track tape machines back into itself so it keeps on repeating and repeating. In studios like Black Ark they were using commercial devices like the Roland Space Echo but Tubbies didn't have that, they were using makeshift equipment and customised things and it was perfectly tailored to make the loudest, spaciest dubs. It wasn't just echo and reverb, Tubby made the desk do strange things. Nowadays DJs use a kill switch uh, to cut certain frequencies and Tubby's desk is a birth of that. The board that I get from Barron and give to Tubby was an MCI board and it have some high pass filter on it. 
I call it the squawky. Them kind of sounds you get from it, you know? That was an exclusive feature because I didn't see any more mixing console with those. People went out and you know, tried to build to imitate King Tubby's iPad filter. They did it, but it didn't come near close to it. It was lovely. That one's known as the uh, Big Knob, by the way, for all you knobheads out there. His main stocking trade was custom dubs. To be refined and develop the echo, reverb and filter effects, but uh, to and use those mute buttons to do improvisations on the mixing board. Those mixes were done to order and live. There were secret weapons at sound systems. Sometimes there was only one copy on vinyl, or rather acetate, and that died. Um, we're lucky though that so much of his work has survived. But here's the thing. You might listen to a record with the name King Tubby on it and it's possible he wasn't even in the room. They were his protégés, the hilariously named Prince, Philip Smart, uh, a prince soon to be King Jammy, and from 1976 onwards, a scientist. There was usually more than one engineer present, uh, Pat Kelly and Leroy Fatman Brown, two of them. Um, making a dub record meant you needed a chain of people and Tubby's was a, a, a perfectly perfectly engineered factory for making dubs and a lot of recordings pass through those facilities. Just some of the records that came out of the Michigan studio were King Tubby meets the Aggravators, meets Rockers Uptown, meets the Scarter Lights. Give me more suggestions down there. Part of his business was of course running a sound system and they, his selectors would have had a special pick from a treasure trove of dubs until the horror year of 1976 when it was shut down. Um, I'll let Tubby describe what happened then. As I said, Easter Sunday 1976 by some police in St. Thomas. They say it was um, violating the law by making noise and disorderly with the sound system. So they come in and smash it up and that was the end of the whole thing. The sound system closed down, but the other areas of his business carried on. He took on another apprentice, Overton Brown, later known as Scientist. He was from a better part of town. His neighbours thought he was involved in crime, visiting someone with the name King Tubby in that neighbourhood every day. Like Tubby, Scientist's dad was a, a, the neighbourhood electrician, and Tubby took the boy on seeing potential. So he was there pressing up dub plates and selling copper wire, and sometimes he got to see inside the studio and the boy watched the man um, making dubs and absorbed it all. One day he made me a bet. I bet if I sent in there, you would know the first thing to do. And he pretty much lost on his bet. By that time, I had seen him and watched him, how he did it. So, and he was promoted to the main team. To be kind of cut down on doing dubs for many people and concentrated on other areas of his business. Uh, the things were done kind of under his name. His name was a trademark itself. Uh, but there was a problem. Home taping was killing dub. Well, again, the market is really slow at this time. And with the tape, with the cassette machine that come in, everybody just using the tape instead of buying a record of records to it. So that the record market is very really struggling at this time. Jamaican music had always had fast moving fashion. The spacey style on King Tubby's records could only be in fashion for so long. And so it kind of faded out. In the 80s, particularly scientists took a lot of these techniques and adapted them to 16 and 24 track studios. And um, King Jammy went on to become one of the biggest earners of the 1980s with his own sound system and became very well known for his hit Under My Sling Tang, uh, which kind of revolutionized reggae. But what had happened was things were different now. It was no longer a few people in the studio, it was two or three. Tubby was happy for his apprentice though, as this interview from 1987 shows. Well, I, I'm very happy for him. I wish him all the best, five more years. There he is, uh, wishing him luck for five more years, but sadly, Tubby didn't have five more years. He was murdered in 1989, tragically and senselessly outside his own home. The motive was presumably robbery, but it's still unsolved to this day. <laughs> <laughs> 